Sir Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, TC, GCB, GCMG, was the second and last Governor General of Trinidad and Tobago and the first President of this twin island state. Born in 1917, he saw this country move from crown colony to self-governance through independence to republicanism. Today, at 91 years old, he reflects on his life in the public and the private spheres. From 1988, for about 10 years, I was a legal consultant. I had an office on 16 Frederick Street, and I did a certain amount of legal work. Mainly after that, but at some stage during that as well, I was involved with a number of organizations, Families in Action, Habitat, uh, Finbarra and Geriatric Home, oh, I'm seen. I've tried to shed most of them now. After all, I do deserve in my time of life a little leisure where I can simply sit and think. He is of a different generation. 91 years old. I think uh, Ulrich Cross is also 1991 years old and is as sprightly as ever, even more sprightly than Zealous. Lady Victoria Hannes was 102 when she died. Another, shall I say, I can't say she's a great friend of mine. She's an aunt, you know, aunt in the comes. Aunt to me. And uh, a lady, in all the senses of the word. You have Lady Hannes, you have Sir, Sir Ellis. That era is going. Only a few of them are left. I grew up in Belmont. I was born in Belmont. In fact, I can tell you precisely where I was born in Belmont. It was the uh, northwestern corner of Pelham Street and Myla Street. And after that, I lived in about six different places in Belmont. So that uh, I, I can say I spent the first 19 years or so of my life in Belmont. When I was young, my mother had a private school and gave some music lessons to me. My father was in the civil service in the Registrar and Marshal's department. I think it goes way back to my mother's time. And she was a friend of his mother. And the story goes that when he was born, my mother crocheted, or crocheted is the word, the booties for his feet. And that's why he has such fine feet right now. In those days, there would have been the normal activities, you know, of you pitch marbles, you spin a top, you play some sort of bat and ball, and all the things that were natural and normal to youngsters at that time. There was no television to look at. When I left my mother's private school, at age seven, I went to what was then called Christian Brothers. It became later Belmont Intermediate, and I think it's now called Belmont Secondary. At Belmont Intermediate, Sir Ellis Clark sat the exhibition exam four times, but contrary to popular belief, he did not win an exhibition. I have known Sir Ellis since we were both 11 years of age. We both got into St. Mary's College. I think I got in a few months before him. I got in in September 1928. Gosh, that's a long time ago, isn't it? I began aiming for membership at junior certificate. That was, by the time I sat for juniors, that would be 1932. And then I won the house scholarship that year. Then 1933, I won the silver medal. So I was even more intent then on winning the island scholarship. As a matter of necessity, let me see, not as a matter of choice. Although he didn't win an exhibition to enter secondary school, Sir Ellis Clark had a brilliant career at St. Mary's College, winning several academic awards from 1932 to 1936. The first imperative was to win a scholarship. That was the important thing. 
and I chose the particular field in which I was most likely to win the scholarship. I wasn't thinking of doing something that was conducive to doing law. Uh, that, what I was doing was trying to win a scholarship. He knew that when he was growing up, he had to do it. He had to win a scholarship, and he was very focused on winning a scholarship. And I think that he felt that um, there were many areas of life that he missed out on, you know. Not that he was ever a great sportsman or had any desire to be, but I think he would have enjoyed the opportunity to play more sports. And I think he would have enjoyed the opportunity perhaps to play a musical instrument or to do other things. And he missed out on those things because he had to focus on the academic side of life. And I think although he expected us to do well academically, he hoped that we would have a broader base of, you know, interests. In 1936, Sir Ellis Clark won an open scholarship in mathematics, and in 1937, he went to London to study law at University College London. Perhaps the most significant event at that time was 1938, when there was a great threat of war and the Prime Minister of the day, Neville Chamberlain, took a trip to Germany and had a little chat with Hitler, who bamboozled him completely. And he came back waving his umbrella and saying, peace in our time. Well, you know, there wasn't peace in our time. But it was very serious because I, like everybody else, I was issued my gas mask, a big heavy bit of apparatus that fortunately I never had to use. On the outbreak of war, he went to Aberystwyth in Wales, and Aberystwyth was quite a small little coastal town, and you were in no great danger. And you might hear the planes, German planes, but from their direction you had an idea whom they were going to bomb, but not Aberystwyth. You don't waste bombs on a little place like Aberystwyth. So I went to London walked into the library at Gray's End that I'd known from 1937 but hadn't seen for quite a while. It was in darkness, the, the door had been ajar. Then I realized that, well, the library was closed. Went to the under treasurer's office and that was closed. But I saw a charwoman who said to me, oh, don't you know the library's closed on a Saturday? Oh, I don't know why. It wasn't in my time. I'll come back on Monday. So I went off to my hotel. And at night I heard terrible sounds, felt the place shake, heard bits of glass fall in. And I thought, well, these brave Londoners put up with this sort of thing all the time. So I don't suppose I should worry too much. And when I woke up next morning, I found that I'd been in the middle of one of the heaviest air raids on London. Houses of Parliament were damaged, St. Paul's Cathedral was damaged. Upon completing a Bachelor of Law degree, Sir Ellis Clark was called to the bar at Gray's Inn. He graduated with first class honors. It was more than challenging. It was, it was not only even bewildering, it was painful. Uh, I began practice, I told you, on the 1st of September. And in December, I had to go to hospital. I was there for five weeks. When I came out in January, of course you're not earning, remember, at that time, but you're paying rent for your chambers, you're paying your telephone bill, you're paying your clerk. And when you come out in January, every solicitor passes by and says, Oh, so you're out of hospital. It's so good. And then they add, you have a brilliant future ahead. Don't do too much yet. And you want to tell them, I have no future ahead because I'm not going to survive for a future ahead at this rate. I'm getting on to a year in practice now, you know, and wondering how long will this torture continue of not knowing what money you're going to earn next month or what's going to happen. And I got a message at a very prominent, very, uh, a man in high position, he, 
he was the Crown Solicitor, but much more than that, a direct access to the governor and so on and so on. And he summoned me and I quaked. And I wondered what had I done wrong? What was he going to reprove me about? And then I found when I went in that he offered me a job to be a legal advisor to the food controller. So there, there, there was a, a price control over a huge range of, of articles in Trinidad and Tobago in 1949, four years after the war. And Ellis drafted most of the legislation. I did very well. I was paid the same salary that a magistrate would be paid, except that a magistrate had to be 10 years in practice. And I was allowed my private practice as well. And I was given work by the Crown, by the Crown Solicitor to do civil matters, and by the Attorney General's Department to do prosecutions. And I suddenly became somebody who was quite well off by the standards of those days. There was a transformation. I'm talking about 1945. I got married in 19, I was a discreet young man. I didn't get married until I could support a wife. In those days, you did not marry a wife who could support you. But, um, so I had to wait until I was, what? 34, oh, exactly 34 and a half, come to think of it. I got married in 1952. I always worked closely with the Crown. I prosecuted at the Assizes, did civil work for the Crown. I was chairman of the first Wages Council in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, I had been made offers before. I was offered a magistracy, I was offered a post as, of assistant to the Attorney General. Uh, it seemed that I was destined to work for this crown. He has a great respect uh, for lawyers of the days of old, like Cassina Gaston Johnson, um, Malcolm Butt, for example, uh, particularly particularly Sir Courtney Hannes, whose brilliance he is always respected, and above all to Courtney, Sir Courtney's uh, cutting wit, uh, many examples of which he has quoted to me over, over the years. In fact, I think that Sir Courtney introduced him to the bar. I was being tossed about by the waves of fortune. Uh, I, I was never applied for a post and I never sought anything. I, every post I've held, I've been offered, including the post of Chief Justice, which I never took up. Trinidad and Tobago was among several countries that sought to bring about a referendum to achieve independence for the region. As a result of the Jamaican referendum, the Federation was in grave danger. For many, many years in the West Indies, there had been talk of federation for decades before it occurred. People from the different islands, including old Mary Shaw and lots of other people, had the idea of what was then known as, um, well, being the same status, shall I say, as Canada or Australia. We were such tiny places that it was felt we could only achieve this by getting together and becoming a viable entity. So that federation was, I think, regarded mainly. This is my view, it's not the generally accepted view. Uh, as a means to an end, you wanted uh, to get a certain status, to get to independence, and you couldn't get it individually, and so you would get it collectively. Then one or two rather small countries, but bigger than any of ours, got independence. And therefore it meant that Jamaica could get its independence, independently of the Federation. And 
Jamaica opted for that course. Now, some 70% of the federal budget was borne by Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Percentage-wise, Trinidad was paying more than Jamaica, but Jamaica being twice the size of Trinidad was paying de facto a little more than Trinidad, but much less per head of population. If Jamaica left, the whole burden would have fallen on Trinidad. I took the view that it was in the best interests of everybody that we should not defer our becoming independent until we had formed an association with one or more of the other territories that had belonged to the Federation. Now, most or perhaps all of the other territories and all the officers of the Federation expected that Trinidad and Tobago would simply continue in the Federation despite the secession, you might call it, of Jamaica. Trinidad and Tobago did not follow this course and there was quite a bit of bitter feeling on the part of most of the other territories to Trinidad and Tobago, and it hasn't all evaporated yet, despite all that Trinidad and Tobago has done for them. My own view was that we'd have all been in a muddle and got exactly nowhere if we had remained trying to patch up a federation without Jamaica. And therefore, we decided to become independent. But, and this is the part that's left out. People just say, we decided to become independent. We decided to become independent, offering one or more of the other units of the Federation to join us in whatever association they wished, be it a unitary state, be it a federation, be it a confederation, or anything else. So we did not abandon them. What happened is that instead of all of us drowning, we kept our head above water and could at least try and save them as we've been trying to do all these years. Sir Ellis Clark is well known for his involvement in drafting the initial independence constitution. This draft was modeled after constitutions of countries which had become independent at that time. It is often assumed that Sir Ellis drafted both the independence and republican constitutions. The constitution that I did the first draft of is the constitution, what we call the independence constitution. Now in 1976, we got the Republican Constitution, which is the one that is in force today. I was not really the draftsman of the, of the Republican Constitution, though everybody attributes it to me. I was at that time Governor General, and the person who did the, the Republican Constitution was the Chief Parliamentary Council. Although Sir Ellis Clark was appointed Chief Justice in April 1961, he never, in fact, assumed that post. Shortly before our formal accession to independence, it was felt that my association with the executive had been so close in making all the preparations for independence that I should not really assume the post of Chief Justice. And I was delighted because I'd tasted a little of the ambassadorial life in Washington. And although law has always been my first love, I certainly didn't mind a flirtation with diplomacy. One of the main architects of the 1962 Independence Constitution, Sir Ellis Clark, attended the Marlborough House Conference in June of that year. 
This conference led to Trinidad and Tobago gaining independence. So that was the Marlboro House Conference. It was attended by the Secretary of State for the Colonies and all his advisors and the government of the day, Eric Williams and his ministers, and the leader of the opposition, Rudranath Capildeo, and all his supporters. And I was there as constitutional advisor to the cabinet. I was sitting between Rudranath Capildeo and Eric Williams. And some of Capildeo's remarks would have been unprintable. But Eric Williams probably didn't hear them because he had his hearing aid on the other side. I was the buffer between the two of them. But the government wanted something and the opposition wanted something else. And everybody got annoyed with me. The opposition felt that I should see their point of view. The government said I should support them. I was, after all, constitution advisor of the cabinet. And I kept my cool and said nothing. So it wasn't allowed to reach deadlock. With their usual technique, the British had a tea break. And everybody caught up. And most people in a huff and a puff. By the time we returned, everything was hanky-dory. Apparently, Bill Williams had said to Rudy Capildeo, look here, we are the only two intelligent people here. Why can't we settle it? But the others. And Capildeo said, but of course. And we had hardly anything more to do. The conference was virtually at an end, prematurely. That was the dramatic closure of the conference. After independence, Sir Ellis Clark was appointed ambassador to the United States of America and permanent representative to the United Nations. Later, he also became Trinidad and Tobago's representative on the Council of the Organization of American States, as well as ambassador to Mexico. His career as a diplomat ended in 1972, when he returned home to succeed Sir Solomon Ho Choi as Governor General. He held this post for three years. Sir Ellis Clark also holds the distinction of being bestowed with several honors, including knighthood, and was among the first to be awarded Trinidad and Tobago's highest honor, the Trinity Cross. When Trinidad and Tobago became a republic in 1976, Sir Ellis Clark was unanimously elected as the country's first president by the Electoral College which comprised both Houses of Parliament. I, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and to the best of my ability preserve and defend the Constitution and the law, that I will conscientiously and impartially discharge the functions of President and will devote myself to the service and well-being of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So help me God. I assumed a duty on the 31st of January, uh, 73. And it ceased when we became a republic in 76. There was an immediate transition then. At midnight, I ceased to be governor, governor general and immediately thereafter became president. And I was president until an election was held and I was elected president in 77 for a five-year term. And then I was re-elected in 82 and I demitted office in 87. While in office, Sir Ellis Clark had the rare experience of having to appoint a successor to the Prime Minister after the demise of Dr. Eric Williams. The death of Eric Williams was quite sudden. I had heard on the Friday that he didn't seem to be well in Parliament. I made inquiries about his health condition on the Saturday. And on the Sunday, early evening, I was told by a minister, tearfully, 
that the Prime Minister was dying. He was almost incoherent, this minister who gave me that information. And I said, my friend, you are telling me he's dying, but from what I gather, he may be dead. Will you please go back and find out whether he's dying or he's dead? Because if he's dying, I have to take one course of action. And if he's dead, I have to take a different course of action. And because the prime minister was dead, I had to appoint, according to the constitution, the leader in the House of the party with the majority of votes. Now, since he was dead, there was no leader in the House, the PNM having a majority of seats. And the provision then goes on to say, if there is no leader, then you appoint the person who, in your opinion, is most likely to command the support of a majority of the members of the House. And I had to act under that limb of the Constitution. I invited for consultation the chairman of the party and the three deputies. And after hearing their views, even particularly their indecision, I talked to certain other prominent members of the party. And I was led to believe that the party or the members of the party in the House would give their support to George Chambers. I therefore had no option but to appoint George Chambers. Sir Ellis Clark was married to Lady Ermintrude Clark for almost 50 years. They had three children, Peter Clark, Margaret Ann, and Richard, who died as a young child. Today, Sir Ellis has five grandchildren. It was really my formative years were spent in Washington. Um, so it was really like home for me. Um, although my dad was ambassador to Washington and also permanent representative to the UN at the time, um, my sister and I really grew up not as diplomatic kids, but uh, more at, like Americans. I was only six when we moved there. And it was very much um, in the time of civil rights movement, um, Martin Luther King. There was a lot of um, segregation. And it was, um, I guess, kind of a politically charged atmosphere. In some ways, Kennedy had been assassinated. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, we were pretty much sheltered from it. And we were very much uh, a close-knit family. And I think, although we were, um, mixing and mingling with Americans and with other American kids. I think we were very much a West Indian family living in America and growing up with West Indian values, um, you know, traditional values. Um, I don't, I never felt American. I always felt Trinidadian. My mom was a bedrock. I mean, she was the, the foundation of it all and um, she kept everything together. My dad was away a lot of the time, um, and she she was with us. You know, she was she was the one who dealt with the day to day issues. She was the one who um, tried to keep everything right for my father to make his life as convenient as possible, because he was working so hard. And at the same time, she was trying very hard to keep everything as stable as possible for my brother and myself. My parents are sort of the most unpretentious, the most sort of unaffected people you could meet. And um, they were really um, quite clear about keeping us grounded and keeping us, um, you know, real. <laughs> I think he, um, he provided an example um, that uh, set the basis for the choices that, uh, that we made in, in, in life, both my sister and I. Um, there was never any pressure, for instance, to uh, become a lawyer, although uh, in the end I chose that path um, from, a, from an education and an initial career point of view. But the example was there of somebody who had, um, who had studied hard, had worked hard, had achieved, and um, I think it really was an example that, uh, that I wanted to follow. 
Well, he has five grandchildren, um, th four boys and a, and a, and a girl and a, and a granddaughter. So needless to say, the granddaughter has a special place, um, being the only granddaughter. I have a special relationship with my grandfather. However, I don't believe that it's any better than any of his other grandchildren. He treats us all equally, and we each have our own special relationship with him. My three kids are, are all boys, and my eldest son, who's now 21, I think has a particularly special relationship, not only because he's the first grandchild, but um, from a young age, uh, my eldest son, John Peter, used to enjoy the company of adults. One of the things that I remember fondest is he used to give us chickadees, put us on his shoulders, and prance about the room singing. Um, I mean, he was sort of full of life and really energetic and just um, everyone else used to sort of, my parents used to run behind us and try and make sure we didn't fall and he would just be dancing about the room. Um, I also remember playing with the corks, the champagne corks. He used to collect them for us and we just used to play games, throwing them about the room or scattering them as far as possible to the corners. We spoke about everything from law. Um, in fact, I think he influenced me to start off my degree in law. Um, and um, yeah, we moved to everything from politics to the stock market um, to the latest girl I was interested in. He comes up at least once a year and, um, you know, on occasion I'd bring friends into London to see him and we'd sort of sit around sipping champagne now that I'm old enough to. Um, and he'd sort of just let loose and tell stories about the good old days. Religion has been a very important, a most decisive part of my life. Now, I'm not saying that I have been as good a Catholic as I ought to have been. I'm not saying that I was perfect in the practice of my religion. What I am saying is that my fundamental beliefs are those of my religion. I regard the practice of religion as the most important aspect of my life. I'm not applying for sainthood or anything like that, but I am saying that I recognize the importance of religion. He is a religious man. Uh, in fact, he sometimes overdoes it. He goes to Mass every day, rain or shine. <laughs> but I am not about to confer sainthood on him at, at any rate, sorry. You know, in Ireland, it is said of Ireland, in fact, in the old days, it was a land of saints and scholars. As far as Ellis Clark is concerned, I, he, I say he's a gentleman and scholar, not a saint, sorry. <laughs> I get my sense of faith and sort of uh, strong sense of religion from him and his influence. Um, you know, I, I try to think, well, where did I get this from? Where did I learn it from? And I think the example that stands out most to me is when my grandmother passed away his strength and sort of just uh, un deep understanding that there was a, a bigger picture to this, that you know God had a plan or that my grandmother was going to heaven. Um, his acceptance of it was just sort of the most tangible example of his faith and that sort of showed me uh, what faith really was. Well, my friendship with Ellis uh dates back, as I said before, since about 1967. And uh, we have had a close relationship ever since, uh, although much older than myself, we had a, a compatibility, a meeting of the minds, as it were. In fact, I would say that we speak to each other on the phone at least three times a week. It's, it's uh, I didn't want to use the same word again, meeting of the minds, but this case is a greater mind than my mind. <laughs> But it's always a very uh, challenging minutes of conversation that ensues from that. Um, as a matter of fact, here is my personal dictionary. Uh, when I have a problem with finding an apt word for a sentence in one of my writings, rather than go to the dictionary and turn the pages and search, I ring Sir Ellis and within two minutes he would give me the correct word to use in the sentence. He has a mastery of the English language, as you know. My father's never been much of a sportsman, but there are two sports that I must say he's always enjoyed. One was boxing, 
not that he ever participated in boxing, but he used to enjoy watching boxing. And the other was, of course, horse racing. Um, and he's, he's enjoyed horse racing for at least the last 30 years. Um, at one stage, we had a number of horses uh, racing in Trinidad and Tobago. And I know he got a lot of joy from that. He used to, um, often on mornings, uh, stop at the paddock in Port of Spain um, early in the morning at 6 or 6.30 and, and look at the horses, train or visit the horses. And of course, he was a regular at uh, race meets um, for many, many years on a, on a Saturday. He included me uh, among his four uh, colleagues who owned several horses. That's where I'm going back now to the 1970s. And we had about four or five horses. And luckily enough, they were all great winners, uh, particularly uh, some horse horse fans will remember the great Clung Prince, who was called the People's Horse, if only because he was always on the tins, and therefore they couldn't lose their money on, on a bet on Clung Prince. But we were. We were not gamblers. I don't think we would spend more than $20 on a race. That was not the interest. It was love of the game, love of the sport, and love of celebrating the wins with a one or two or three or four or five or more champagnes at the end of the evening. It wouldn't be all work and no play. For instance, if you speak of social activities, I certainly enjoyed dancing. And I would not be lacking in humility if I said that I was a good, a very good dancer. Because humility is truth. And if I said I was a good sportsman, it would not be humility or, or anything. It would be stupidity. So if I say that I was a good dancer, this is what I was in my day. I think I was a fair expert on the dance floor. Possible. But uh, Sir Ellis fancies himself to be a great ballroom dancer. I think it, he learned this when he was a student in London. And he would be on the dance floor at the drop of a hat, ready like Freddy to go on the dance floor. As a matter of fact, Freddy is an appropriate term. Probably, I should say, ready as Fred Astaire <laughs> to go on the dance floor. In fact, in his 90th birthday party, the first man on the dance floor was Ellis. <laughs> Whereas, when the music started to play, that was my cue to leave. <laughs> but that was his cue to dance throughout the night. <laughs> no, we don't have a common love for dancing. I still listen to, because I enjoyed a lot of music that wasn't strictly dance music. I mean, I'm a little too fast or a little too slow. But I, I listened to a lot of the old tunes that I knew in 1937 and so on. And uh, they're still as fresh as ever. Every now and again, they recur. And uh, people say, oh, that tune, I heard it before. I heard it in 1960. I said, yes, you heard it in 60. I heard it in 1938. Just a couple of evenings ago, I was listening to some of them. Smoke gets in your eyes. The Hoagie Carmichael um, classic, Stardust. I danced to them, I knew all the words of them, I cherish them. From humble beginnings in Belmont, Sir Ellis Clark worked hard and often in challenging circumstances. With a career that spanned over four decades, he remains a measured voice of reason, noted for his tact and wit. A statesman who has served his country with distinction and who bore his honors and high offices exceptionally well. It is almost impossible to overstate Ellis' contribution to the development of Trinidad and Tobago. It has been an immense contribution. And I gather he is still contributing. <laughs> Although he has dined and wined with kings and queens and princes and princesses, he still does not lose 
the common touch. And uh, he's a humble man. And that humility makes him endearing to those who know him well. Generosity, I think, is, is, uh, is something that uh, he takes very seriously and, and helping others. Um, and uh, as I say, he has, he has done more than his fair share in his life. Uh, usually, as I say, quietly, uh, without any publicity, without anyone knowing. He's instilled in both my brother and myself a strong sense of social justice. And um, the work that I do now, I think it all comes from the early days. And um, my father, he's very clear about, you know, in terms of um, Catholic social teaching, um, you know, that we are born um, in the image and likeness of God and that we are all born with inherent dignity and that, you know, we go through life, we have to appreciate that in each other.